Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now you may remember a few years ago that I underclocked my Ryzen 5 3600 to just 800 megahertz for no other reason than I thought it would be quite amusing. As it turned out, it was quite amusing and games still ran, albeit with pretty terrible 1 and 0.1% lows, but this was to be expected. I decided to revisit this subject again today, again for no real reason, I just wanted to see if we could still sort of underclock a modern Core i5 12th gen CPU and as it turns out we can. Now just like with the Ryzen years ago I could only get the speed as low as 800 megahertz or 0.8 gigahertz. This of course is fine but I wanted to go a little bit lower than this considering these terrible speeds have already been achieved. So what I did was go into the advanced CPU settings and set a wattage limit for the CPU. Now you can input any number you like here. If you want the CPU to consume less power, you could input 45, for example, and the CPU will try and use less than this. I, I'm not exactly sure how it works. I, I'm not too um, knowledgeable on all this wattage and power consumption stuff, but if you put in a lower figure than is stated by default, for example, the 12400 is a 65 watt processor, then the CPU is going to try and use less than that and so it might reduce the clock speeds and things like that. It just means that your CPU performance will be limited as opposed to the default setting. Now I found that you can actually put the number one in these boxes <laughs> in an attempt to try and limit the CPU to use one watt of power but unfortunately I think the system overrides this because I don't even think it would have the juice to power up or load windows if it was consuming such little power. As it was the CPU was averaging around three and a half watts at idle and maxed out at around six and a half. This meant that the CPU was limiting itself to just 400 megahertz or 0.4 gigahertz, which as you can imagine is pretty slow, but it didn't mean that the system was totally unusable. I mean, in terms of raw CPU power, yeah, I noticed a huge difference from 4.4 gigahertz boost to just 400 megahertz capped and doing anything like browsing the internet or even trying to open DaVinci Resolve to edit a video was pretty disastrous. That said, we could still run some games and I wanted to get into that now because the results, as frustrating as they were to get hold of, are quite fascinating in my opinion. So let's get into it and see what it's like to game at just 400 megahertz. Spoiler alert, it's painful. So under normal circumstances at stock clocks, the i5-12400F is a fantastic all-rounder. It's brilliant for video editing, fantastic for gaming, and I'm very thankful for Intel for actually sending one over because it's now part of my personal rig, the one I detailed in the last video. You can pretty much pair it with any GPU and it will run fine. Six cores, 12 threads. It really is a fantastic chip, but you might be a little bit put off by the cost of socket 1700 motherboards, though I'm sure they will start to drop in price, and I've got mine paired with a basic H610 board. In pairing with a 1080 Ti here, it's fantastic at 1080p, and even with modern games, you should be able to achieve over 60 FPS easily with decent graphical quality settings. But now, if we switch to the 400 megahertz or 0.4 gigahertz gameplay, well, prepare to be either disappointed or surprised, I guess depending on the title. Now I thought for sure that CSGO would do better than this, after all we were getting over 400 FPS with the stock speeds and I thought surely a drop to 400 MHz won't be that bad. The Ryzen 5 3600 at 800 MHz still sort of hit playable frame rates a couple of years ago but I suppose 400 MHz is quite another significant drop and we are running with reduced power as well. I don't really think that makes a difference. I mean, 400 megahertz is 400 megahertz, right? This is just the sort of core clock limit imposed on the chip because of that TDP limitation that I've put in place. So I think even if you were able to clock it down to 400 megahertz without tinkering with the wattage settings, this is still the level of performance you'd see. Cyberpunk 2077, however, well, this was a much better result. In the emptier areas, let's say the Badlands or outside of Night City, just on the outskirts of the city itself, you will see, uh, I was going to say 60 FPS, no way, 20 FPS, 
around about 20 to 30 FPS. If there's not much going on, this at 400 megahertz, which in my opinion is actually quite impressive. I mean, I wasn't expecting more than five frames per second here, especially considering the CPU intensive nature of the game. I've done all I can to help the game out. I've reduced the crowd density option to low, but even so, it's not quite enough in order to hit playable frame rates when we get into the busier areas of Night City. And it's here we'll see the frame rate drop to around 15, 10 FPS. Still, not a terrible effort, quite a surprising result. Now, for some odd reason, in GTA San Andreas, the definitive edition, sorry about my squeaky chair, by the way, if you can hear that in the background. Yeah, in the definitive edition of San Andreas, the Dodo, the plane at Los Santos Airport doesn't spawn, which is really weird. I might do a follow up and see at what speed of the CPU the plane actually spawns at because never in my life has the Dodo not spawned here. Seriously. I played it on PS2 back in the day, the Dodo was always here. I've played it on PC for years, I've played this definitive edition for months, and the Dodo has always spawned. But here at 400 megahertz, nothing. Thankfully, the other planes do, but the Dodo doesn't like the low clock speeds, which is very odd. Now that said, when we did finally find an aeroplane and get up in the air, the frame rate wasn't too bad. The average was about 25 FPS, again with pretty poor 1 and 0.1% lows, but it is what it is. It's quite a surprising result. I didn't expect to achieve over 10 FPS here again, especially after experiencing the CSGO result. So the game is somewhat playable, even though I wouldn't recommend dropping your clock speed at all with a chip like this or any chip unless you're trying to build an ultra low power system, in which case you just go for a lower TDP CPU to begin with, or perhaps limit it to 35 watts instead, not six. <laughs> it was The Witcher 3 that provided the second most playable experience of the day. This actually felt more playable in parts than San Andreas. There were some areas that hit 30 FPS, no problem. More areas here than there were in Cyberpunk and San Andreas, so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, well, I was going to say good, but it's not good. It's one of the least terrible experiences at 400 megahertz today. So, I mean, it is doable. As you can see here running around, I can't remember what this city's called off the top of my head. Oh, I apologise to all of you hardcore Witcher fans. Um, as a fan of the game myself, I'm disappointed that I couldn't remember. It's not Novigrad, it's, it's, it's the other one. Yeah, <laughs> but... What's important here is that it still runs, so even if for some reason your i5 finds itself clocked at 400 megahertz, you can still have a somewhat enjoyable experience in parts, but the 1.1% low are again going to suffer. The number of background characters was set to low to help things, but it's not going to help that much. And so concludes a rather pointless endeavour, but I hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.